It was July 6th, 2005. It was the day that my wife, Rachel, was going to have our very first baby. We got into the waiting room and they rushed her into um, and get the birth stuff started, whatever the ladies did. Um, I was in um, the hospital at that day getting my broken arm fixed. Um, I was stupid enough and manly enough not to go the night before. So the day came for my daughter to be born. All of a sudden in the waiting room as she was pushing and doing her girl stuff, whatever you ladies do, <laughs> to push out the baby, there was this eeriness in the room. As soon as the doctor looked up at the nurses, all the nurses knew exactly what that look meant. That look meant she's going to have to have a C-section because the baby is stuck. The baby cannot come out. Come to find out the umbilical cord was wrapped around and the baby, Madison, needed to be cut open and brought out to life. Rachel and I looked at each other and we're like, why are they rushing in all this stuff? Why are they rushing in? Why is there a panic? What's going on right now? In tears, we looked at each other and we just started praying. We just started praying. We prayed some more. We let people we knew know that we're going to be going into surgery. For my very first baby, I'm saying, my wife is going to die. My child that I don't even know is going to die. Those thoughts go around in my mind. And all of a sudden, they, they push me aside. Not literally, but say, stay here. And they rush my wife out. I'm like, I love you. I, I really do. But I, did, I didn't have a chance to say goodbye. I, God, why is this going on? Why is this going on? I'm a youth pastor. We love you. It's supposed to just pop out, hug the baby, cut, and yay, we have a baby. But it's not like that. In this situation, I remember they gave me a mask and a, and a really cool like medical cap that I wish I would have kept. Um, they rushed me in and, and I could hear them setting up in the operating room and they said, sir, sit here. And literally, it's probably like the size of this with a chair, a wall here and a wall in the back. And they, they said, sir, sit here and we'll come and get you. Do you know how long sitting here felt like, I felt like hours and hours. It probably was only like 10 minutes. On my knees, I turned in that chair, weeping. And as that song says, crying out. Said, God, take my wife. Take my baby. Protect my baby. Pleading with every ounce of me. More than I've ever probably prayed before in my life. Saying, God, earnestly, persistently coming to you. And I'm saying, Protect her. Protect her. Protect my baby. Not today. I remember, God, don't take her today. Don't take her today. I want to see my daughter. I want to say hello to my wife as she wakes up the next morning. Don't do this, God. The most intense, seeming like two hours, five minutes of my life, they brought me in. And it was, it was, it was interesting. I had the, the curtain up. And, and she, <laughs> come find out she was kind of allergic to the medicine. So her teeth were chattering and everything. I'm like, what's going on? My wife's teeth are chattering. What did you give her? What's going on? And I'm just sitting there praying over her, praying with her. And I'm saying, it's going to be okay. And all of a sudden, um, I, I hear the baby come out. And I don't think the baby, Madison, even cried. They rushed her into the room. And they, I'm like, there goes my baby. Is she dead? What, what's going on? Type of thing. Uh, we kept on praying and praying and praying. Long story short, we have my beautiful daughter, Madison. Rachel's okay. And the next time the C-section happened, I looked up, said, it's going to be okay. And I watched the cutting. And it was just awesome. It was great. It was just great. It was great. But I know my God is able and willing through prayer able to do some amazing things. And I know in this room right now that because of the power of prayer by the corporate church, miracles have happened. And I don't even want to imagine what would have happened if I would not have prayed. If other people would not have prayed for my daughter Madison to be okay. 
I don't even want to think about that. But all I do know is I am giving credit to prayer and my God in heaven to allow my wife and daughter to be here today. And I think in our lives, we sometimes forget when we have prayed earnestly and how God has worked out miracles. I believe with the whole, my whole heart, if we as Catalyst Church would just be a consistent praying church. And you're like, Dave, I don't know how to pray. Today I'm going to teach you on a basics on how to receive amazing power in prayer. You don't have to have a Bible scholarship. You don't have to do any, be the super religious person. You just need to have a relationship with God the Father. And I promise you, if we as Catalyst Church will join together in prayer, I believe that our mission of this year will be accomplished. I believe that within this, this area, this green area, is roughly about 50,000 people. Within the red radius around here, one mile from this church building is almost 25 to 30,000 people that they need our, our Jesus. And the question I have for you at the very beginning, are you, rhetorical question, so think to yourself, are you seriously praying for these people you don't know? Are you seriously doing it? Or is it one of these, oh, Dave says to pray, so I'm just going to pray today or for a couple minutes? I want to challenge you, if you are on this map within a mile, this actually goes out to three miles. If you're on this, go ahead and put this little red pin there so we can see where people are. And then we can start praying for um, our areas where we're at. Sound good? All right, so are we praying? And I believe that if we're not praying, we're going to lose. We're going to lose. So well, I'm going to read, uh, we're going to go through a story, um, going th still through the book of Acts. So everybody turn to Acts chapter 12, um, and we're going to see some, uh, there, we're going to see an amazing God story because of prayer. The topic kind of today is this, breaking free on your what? Knees. Breaking free on our knees. And if we want to break free from different things that are in our lives, things that are in other play, people's lives, we want to be humbly on our knees and praying earnestly, not just yourself, but as a corporate body of Christ followers. Are you with me? Yes. All right, here we go. Acts chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 1. If you do not have a Bible, that red Bible in your seat is yours too. Keep. Keep that Bible for yourself. If you already have three or four Bibles at home, leave that for somebody else. But it's on page what of the Red Bibles? 767. 767. All right, go ahead and turn to 767. Let's all read this. It's, it's pretty cool. You ready for some cool stories? Yes. All right, you want to know how to pray? Yes. yes. Are you guys awake? Yes. All right, here we go. Acts chapter 12, starting verse 1. It was about this time that King who? Herod. Herod. Pause. It's going to be a short message, I hope. All right, King Herod. King Herod was one of these people that was half Jew, but he was recruited by the Roman guard, the, the basically the rulers of that time, to become the king, to become the ruler over all these Jewish people. So he, he had that balance to do. He had to please the Jewish people, and he had to please the Roman government. That's what his position was. He was a tyrant, a mean tyrant tyrant guy who really hated Christians. Because Jewish hate, hated Christians, the Romans didn't know who these Christians were, so he said, hey, let's persecute these Christians. Let's persecute them. Come to find out in historical um, fact is, people said it was better to be a Christian and persecuted for your faith than to be a part of Herod's family. Herod was a meanie. He hated people. His whole family line, part of Herod's family line, was he, he wanted to annihilate the children of the land when Jesus was born. The same family line. Long story short is this guy hated and persecuted who? Jesus. Acts. Yeah, Christian. Jesus has already been ascended into heaven. The church is growing. So all of a sudden there's this massive persecution that goes on. So the king, this Jewish king... This is what ended up happening. So at this time, King Herod arrested some of those who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. But this is what happened. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Let's think about that for a second. Who is James? The brother of who? John. James was actually one of the close-knit people of Jesus. He was the, You got Peter... 
James, and who? John. You hear that all the time in the Bible. You got Peter, James, and John. They're the three closest people. And here's James. The close-knit people. But God? God allowed James to die by the sword. God what? Allowed James to die by the sword. God what? Allowed James to die by the sword. Do you think the church was probably praying for James? Probably, probably. We don't know, but most likely they were. But God said, James, I want you to come to heaven. I, I want you to come to heaven. So James died. But what ended up happening is King Herod got so excited about this death because the Jewish government, the Jewish powers that be, got so excited, and you'll see in a second, they were so excited about James dying. And they're so excited about the persecution of the church. So what do you think that made uh, uh, King um, um, Herod want to do more? Kill more. He wants to imprison more. He's like, oh man, finally they like what I'm doing. They like me killing people, and I like to kill people, so let's kill some more. And there's a group called the Christians. Let's kill them more. And God, what? Allowed it to happen. Sign that, pull back. God allows, even through prayer, bad stuff to happen in our lives. Who are we to say, shame on you, God, for allowing James. James, out of anybody, can trump anybody in this room, including me, and his stature closer to Jesus than anybody else here. So what is to say that we can go to God and say, God, you stink, you're terrible, you're bad, because you allow this, that, and other to happen? Who are we? What are we just called to do? Serve. We're called to pray. And do what God says. That's it. And if God decides to act upon it, He will for His purpose and His glory. You with me? Yes. Sir. But we're called to pray. And this is what the story continued to say. So he seized it. And when he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to, to seize Peter also. And Peter was the head of the church in Jerusalem. He just cut off the head, re remove Peter, and this sect will go away. And it make the Jewish people very, very, very happy. So we saw he took on Peter, and it said this happened during the Feast of, the, of Unleavened Bread. After, after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to the guard, um, and had four squads of four soldiers, um, each guarding him. Herod intended to bring him out and put him on public trial after the Passover. So again, what was King Herod trying to do since it's one of these massive feasts? What is he trying to do? Yes, yeah, send a message. He's like, hey, check it out, Christians. I'm after you. And by the way, all of you who are not Christians, I've got your back. And I'm going to kill the Christians that you hate. I hate them as well. In other words, talk about a political thing. That was a political move in front of all these people. You got the picture? All right. And the church didn't do one of... The You'll see what the church did in a second. The church didn't go, oh no, James is dead. Oh, woe is me. Let's suck our thumb. Oh, life stinks. Life is terrible. Let's just go somewhere else. Let me not attend church. Let me not pray. Let me not read my Bible. Life stinks. Did they do that? Do we do that? Yes. How many of you guys have ever done that before? Imagine instead of going like this, sucking our thumb when bad things happen, we go like this and pray on our knees and humbly come before God. And this is what the church did. They didn't get freaked out. They simply prayed. So this is our key verse. If you want to highlight, underline, circle, um, whatever this, go ahead and do this. Verse 5, it says, So Peter was kept in where? Okay, the head, uh, check this out. It's like Catalyst Church pastor. They come in, they arrest me, and all of a sudden Dave is somewhere else, and the church didn't stop worshiping. They didn't stop praying. They didn't stop meeting. 
Did they? No. What happens if Dave is arrested, car accident, whatever? I mean, what happens? Should the church still continue to pray and continue to move? Absolutely. And this church is not about me. It's not about Rachel. It's not about the elders. It's about the church coming together, no matter what happens. So no more of this, all this. It's not about Dave. It's about us coming together in prayer. And this is what happens. So Peter was kept in prison, but the underlying church, but the what? Church. church. The corporate body of believers, but the church was, two words underlined, earnestly praying. What were they doing? Earnestly, earnestly praying for, to God for who? Him. Peter. You got that? Okay, if you get this, this will radically change your life in prayer, okay? That verse, okay, the Lord's Prayer is great. It's, it's, it's a great model, but this is how we do the Lord's Prayer. This is how we pray. You with me? The first thing I want you to write down is this. The church, oh, side, side, side note, is this, is this. The result being of them praying was that Peter got out of prison. He wasn't killed. All right? So there's the, there's the ending. I don't want to mess up the story. But guess what? Peter gets out in a miraculous way. And we're going to see that in a second. So because they prayed, God worked a miracle out and Peter got out. Okay? You got the picture? So how did that happen? One is this. They were united together in prayer. United together in prayer. There has been so many, I mean, so many things over this last year that Catalyst Church has united together in praying for. And one thing is this building. And I still need you to pray for this building because the government is still red tape, red tape, red tape, red tape for us to own the building, okay? But right now, it, it, a couple months ago, or probably about six months ago, we were meeting right back where you guys were at, okay? All right, you with me? All right, so we were meeting right back here. I think I was sitting right about where Anna Lee was sitting, okay? So right here, I, I was sitting where Anna Lee was sitting. And all the men uh, who came to Bible study, by the way, Thursday night Bible study, great time for you guys, men and women to come, great advertisement. Okay, so the men and the women, or the men of the church were sitting right here, and I came to them. For those, who, who was there during that meeting? Okay, great. I came to them, and I said, Catalyst Church men, I've got a situation, and, and we, I told them about the building. Long story short is either we're going to lose the building or get the building. And a miracle had had to happen in order for us to get this building. Okay? You with me? A what had to happen? Miracle. miracle. And what ended up happening? I said, guys, you need to be praying with me. And right then and there, they prayed. And they all stepped up and said, we're praying, we're praying, we're praying. And they did there and they continued to do. Long story short, the next couple days... Um, a miracle happened, and right now, Catalyst Church, do you realize that Catalyst Church and the power of prayer is the reason why the whole state of, or the whole county of or Vandenberg County has completely had to change a code, a change part of their documents, to because God acted upon something that. Humanly speaking, could not and should not happen. So because of the power of prayer, we were able to expand and expand and expand. And by the way, we still need your prayer. But listen, because of uniting together, because of earnesty, because of consistent prayer, you are sitting literally, and I wish, I wish you could have been there, you're sitting in a miracle right now. Seriously, you're sitting in a miracle right now. All right? It wasn't because of me. It wasn't because of anything else. It's because what did the men of Catalyst Church do? Pray. 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 They united together and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And a miracle happened. So uniting together is so very important. And there's been... You, we don't just put something on Facebook or many of you guys don't just put something online or you, you don't put something on our prayer request thing just because, ooh, hey, let me tell you my story. What do people want when they publicize what they, they need prayer for? Their prayer. Okay. So if that's the case, okay, let me ask you a serious question. How many of you guys, when you see a post or a prayer request, you pray 
Now, be honest, be honest. And I'll, I'm going to raise my hand with this. Admission is good. When I see a prayer request, I sometimes say, you know what? I will pray for that later. Or if I look at it, I'll say like a two-second prayer. And then all of a sudden, um, I see later on that something bad happened. And I'm like, oh, why didn't I pray? How many guys have, when you see something or hear something, that you really don't pray? Raise your hand. You really don't pray. Okay. Now imagine... Imagine if we would all as a church, when we see a prayer request on Facebook, read a prayer thing, come on now Friday night to our prayer meeting or prayer time. Listen, imagine if we would all join together. Imagine the praise reports that would come back if it's God's will because we have all united together in prayer. You with me? There's power in prayer. The Bible talks about pray for our nation. Pray, pray, pray. I think we are sissies when it comes to praying. And you're like, I don't know how. I don't know how. It's as simple as this. We can have a conversation, and that's how we can with God. You don't need to know the Lord's Prayer. You don't need to have a master's degree. You don't need to know the Bible. You just need to know that God is listening, and He wants to hear from our heart. That's it. There's no fanciness. There's a genuine heart pleading to God because we have a relationship with Him. You with me? Yes. Do, you, do you get that? If we would all pray, not, hey, pastor, would you pray for me? I will, and I need to, and I do. But imagine if we would all pray, what a miracle would happen within our country, our city, and the lives that we are united together to pray. You with me? Kind of quiet. Maybe that means, I don't want to do I don't want to pray for people. Okay. The next one is this. The church, how, how, what type of praying did they do? Earnest. Earnestly. Okay. In the original language, and even the King James Version uses this, the, the word earnesty uh, really kind of means persistent, persistent, and boldness. They boldly became before God. They, per, they persist. They were focused. They, 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 were, they were just so, oh, God, let Peter out. God, let Peter out. Let Peter out. Let Peter out. Let Peter out. You with me? It's not one of these, oh, God, check it. This person needs, needs help. This person needs help. Great. Do whatever you want to do. Amen. And you go watch your TV. When was the last night, last time you bent humbly to your knees and screamed out to God? Kind of like at a football game. We get so excited about a football game. And we're like, ooh, let me tell you about the score. Let me tell you about the score. A UFC fighter, whatever you ladies do. Oh, let me tell you about a coupon that I found. Woohoo! All right. You want the world to know, okay? Think about this. How many times do we earnestly say, God, listen to me? How many guys have ever yelled at God before? Who's never yelled at God? It's okay to yell at God. Okay. All right. God, listen to me. We need your help here. God, Peter's in prison. God, we don't want another James. We want Peter to come out. Lord, just uh, please hear us. Just this, this heartfelt prayer. That's what it's talking about. Not one of these sissies, oh, Lord, I bless them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and may they get well. God's like, you pansy, you think I'm like that wussy? Talk to me like a man. Talk to me like a godly woman, because I want that. That is the type of prayer that they were praying, which allowed Peter to come out. Turn your Bibles real quick into Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, um, and this is, this is from Jesus himself, and Jesus said this is how, if you keep on persisting and praying, that things can miraculously happen. So Luke chapter 11, starting verse 5. It says this, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight. Lord, please don't call me at midnight. But, and says, friends, let me, let me have three loaves of bread, because my friend of mine has come from a long journey, and, he has, and I have nothing to give him or put before him. Then the one on the inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. 
Here's a little background. But basically, the, the Jewish, um, the Israelite people, they, they had small little houses. Okay, small little houses. And because of either the heat or because they're cold, they try to sleep in the same room together. Okay? So the way it worked was this. When he says he can't, it means the following. The door's locked. My family is all together in the same room. I can't because I'm going to have to get up, wake up my children, wake up other people, and I have to walk to the door and let you have some food. So literally, when he says he can't, it means, you know what? I, I can't wake up my family. It's midnight. You, my son, if he wakes up in the middle of the night, he is a cranky bugger in the ne next day. All right? So he's like, I can't because of an Ethan type of thing. All right? So he's saying this. Ah, I don't want to. I, it's, it's, it's an inconvenience. It is, oh, do you realize? In other words, sometimes it's this way. People say on Facebook, or they come to you, in the middle of the, um, after the service and say, hey, can you pray for me? And many times, yeah, sure, I'll, sure, I'll. And we walk out the door, go to, go to um, McDonald's or wherever you go eat. And by the time you go out, you've forgotten about it. And they are asking to say, hey, can you pray for me? On Facebook, prayer requests. He's saying, stop what you're doing and come help. You might not be able to help with a relationship. You might not be able to help their finances, but you can pray. And this is what ends up happening. Then the one on the inside, he said, don't bother me, the doors are locked, verse 8. I tell you, though he will not get up, in other words, though it's inconvenient, it says, and give him bread because he is his friend. Again, because he is our brother or sister. Because we are brothers and sisters in Christ, we're going to stop doing what we want to do and pray and help. And it says this, because of the man's boldness, in other words, that's the same word as earnesty and persistent, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, I mean Jesus, God, says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and whoever seeks finds and whoever knocks, the door will be opened to him. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is what happens. The blessings are on the other side. What he's saying is, come to me as your father and don't do this. God, are you listening to me? Hey, I need this. You know what? We need to pray for it. Pray for it. It's not even, God, did you hear me? Did you hear me? Did you hear me? No, it's this. God, do you hear me? You with me? And it doesn't stop. I might knock down the door. It's like, you keep knocking. You keep knocking. You keep knocking. You keep knocking. God, do you hear me? 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 When's the last time you prayed like that? Guess what he says. No matter if God is busy, he'll open up the door and he'll let the blessings flow. The church. The church. Boldly, persistently, eagerly, intensely, Pray that Peter was going to be led out. Corporately together. Not minding their own business, but minding the business of one specific person. So step three is this. When he prays specifically, specifically, that verse in verse five, it says, the church earnestly was praying to God, what? For him. For Peter. They weren't saying, hey God, hey, heal the world. God, may, may Jerusalem come to know Jesus. No, they were praying specifically for who? Peter. And I think we need to do the same thing. We need to specifically come before God and say, God, okay, do you know this person? I don't even know them. I don't know the situation. But listen, God, do you hear me? 
please help with Charlie. I don't know what's happened with Charlie, but God, please help Charlie. I'm eagerly, you know the situation, but I'm specifically playing for Charlie. Or if you know the situation, Lord, please be with Charlie. And, and you know what? Charlie doesn't have a job. God, get him a job. Get him a job. Lord, please, specifically, I'm coming to Charlie to get a job. Charlie, get a job. Charlie, get a job. Why is that so awesome? Was that? Yeah, it's heartfelt. What else? Specific. What else? Was that? It's persistent. But check this out. You're all right, but this. When the miracle happens, we can say we specifically pray that Charlie got a job. And Charlie got a job specifically. Praise God. We can say, hey, in order to get a touchdown, we need to get into the end zone. We're focused in all the guys. I mean, there might be distractions left or right. There's big linebackers want to knock you on your butt type of thing. But the goal, the goal is to throw it into the end zone. God will receive it and watch the specific prayers happen so that we can glorify God. You with me? So the church specifically prayed for Peter. They earnestly prayed for Peter. And they united together as one. So let's find out exactly what really truly happened to in the story of Peter. Miracles are right in front of our face. Are you praying? Are you seeking God for those answers? I believe with everything inside of me that we can break free by the power of God if we simply would just pray. I want you to write down one last thing. It's this. 
Number four is this. We need to be willing to thank God with the yes, the no, and the maybe. Did the church praise God because James died? Probably. Because they were on the right path. Do they praise God with this? It's, the, the pastor continued to say, it's a great drama, the, the pastor continued to say that Peter left there and went to tell other people. So other people would believe. Listen, we need to thank God when our specific prayers are answered and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. That's why I think specifically earnest prayers can do so. We have one right here. I'm going to, sorry, Sean. Everybody say hi to Sean. Sean, raise your hand right there. Sean, right there. And this is a, is a beautiful example of this. Beautiful example. I got a, I got a message um, that, that Sean was, was, I mean, by the way, Sean had back surgery. Um, and the church was praying. Um, and long story short was, is Sean came into the recovery room. Um, and, and he was having a seizure in bed. He fell out of bed, went unconscious. Um, and long story short, I was called, Debbie was called, other people were called. And we went up to his room. And I'm telling you what, I mean, I was, I was very, very nervous. Because it's one of these, we're praying with him. And I mean, he was like, by the way, you were snoring, dude. I mean, yeah, I know you were out, but you were snoring. All right? But check this out. <laughs> it was really cool, though. All right? But here, here is Sean. I mean, he is... As far as we know, that Sean was not ever, ever going to wake up. We don't know what happened. We're going to find out now we, we know what happened. But Sean, we did not know what was going on. All of a sudden, Debbie and myself and others, we started to bombard Facebook, bombard text messages. And by the way, that's important why, why we have text messaging services and everything like that. And Facebook, we bombarded it and all of a sudden... Boom, out of nowhere. Spontaneously, people said, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. No joke. As soon as we, I walked out of the room because I had to go on my bus, I got a text from Debbie and said, you'll never believe it. And I said, he's awake, isn't he? Like, absolutely. He's awake. He's not all there, but he's awake and he's alive. And, he, he's, he's, and sooner or later, and a couple hours later on, he was joking around like his humorous self. I believe with everything inside of me that we as the church unified together, we specifically prayed with him, and I believe that many of you prayed with him and with me earnestly for him. And he is sitting right now, and I believe we, give, we need to give God the glory for him being here. But, and there's lots of stories like that, but would we still be applauding and praising God if he would have passed away? Why? Yeah, absolutely. He, we know that our Sean would be up in heaven celebrating with Jesus. And we don't know why Sean could have died. Or maybe he would have been in the comatose state for an entire month. Would we still be praising our God? Would we still be worshiping our God? Or would we be sucking our thumb and say, hey, life stinks? God works in mysterious ways. There's three characters. John the Baptist was put into prison and beheaded. And Jesus was alive. Jesus could have walked into that room, let him out, paused time, the time-space continuum or whatever. He could have paused time, walked into there. Jesus would, could have been able to pull his, his cousin out and say, hey, keep baptizing. But he didn't. He let him die. Beheaded at that. James was killed by the sword. Paul begged God to remove this thorn off his flesh. Um, and, and God's like, nope. It's to keep you humble. It's to keep you humble. I love these two closing verses. It says in Isaiah 55 verse 8. For my thoughts, God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. Declares. Not just says the Lord. Declares. The Lord. Jeremiah 29 11. You guys don't all know Jeremiah 29 11. But we normally stop at 11 and we need to read all the way through. It says this For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Verse 12. Then you will call on me and I will come and come and pray to me. 
And I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. It's time, Catalyst Church, for us to be a praying church. If you say, hey, I just accepted Christ. I don't know how to pray. It's simply talk to him with sincerity. Get other people around you to pray. And pray specifically. And we need to praise God in the yeses, the noes, and the maybes. No matter what. Because God thoughts are not our thoughts. Neither is God's way our way. No matter what, the yes, no, or maybe, God is still on the throne. He ain't budged a bit. So let's continue to earnestly pray as a church. Sound good? Yes. Everybody, raise your hand if you're on board. Let's prove it.